but it really is important that we develop a focal point of articulacy around um, ourselves as we age, ourselves as we develop disabilities. Um, the disability lobby currently uses the phrase, they used to talk about the able-bodied, they now talk about the presently able-bodied. So um, Susan Sontag talks about, in her illnesses metaphor, this issue of illness being a second citizenship, that we're all the present or future ill. And she talks about, however, that it was impossible to take up residence in this second kingdom, the kingdom of illness, unprejudiced by the lurid metaphors with which it has been landscaped. And by this she meant that, and she was talking about cancer in the 1980s when she had cancer, and the landscape was very negative. People weren't on the front cover of Cosmo. People thought, well, that was it, you had your chips. And that things have hugely changed. And part of the reason they changed is because someone like Susan Sontag, a bright, articulate uh, person, wrote a book called Illnesses Metaphor, which mo moved the, uh, the whole um, scenario along. And in the same way, um, T.S. Eliot in The Four Quartets talks about you know, each venture is a new beginning, arrayed on inarticulacy, arrayed on the inarticulate. We, we, in a way, because for so long we've taken it almost for granted that the idea of um, killing people or helping people to commit suicide is, is, a, is, is clearly not a prudent or a good idea, is that all of a sudden, when I suppose that consensus breaks, very often we're not prepared for it. It's almost like being mugged in a way. And there's a couple of uh, extra and special features, I think. So I'm going to talk about it in terms of how do we approach this, for example, how do I approach this with the students? Because I have been doing some ethics teaching with the students and I've been doing ethics teaching with our um, uh, trainees. I also write a column once a month and in the Irish Times, I write in the blo a blog in the BMJ. I would do research in ethics. And it strikes me that there's a couple of key issues that those of us here in the room, and hopefully in a wider sense, need to take into account. And one of them is uh, Nietzsche's comment that convictions are greater enemies of truth than lies. And this lies on both sides of the debate. It lies on the side of the debate who are, uh, and particularly the, the pro-euthanasia, pro-suicide fa pro faction is not in fact largely related to late, later life, which is where I mostly do my practice. It's related to late middle age, early old age, where people actually are, are, have extraordinary negative prejudices about aging and disability that would not be tolerated for racism, would not be tolerated for sexism. But we too may well have convictions, and we've got to be very careful about how our convictions is that we, we're now into a public debate space. So. I think there's a couple of things we need to think about in Ireland. It is a small country, and in a small country people sometimes feel uncomfortable about challenging other people. And I think in the recent case in the, uh, uh, in the courts in Ireland, clearly people felt a little bit uncomfortable. Where we've also got a highly individualistic culture. One of the clientelism has kept our small hospitals like Port Leisha open, so the reason we have a scandals in Port Leisha Hospital is largely to do with the Irish people and their engagement with their politicians, because the people of Port Leisha don't understand, or their politicians do not provide sufficient leadership for them to realise you cannot have this individualistic service down here and expect high standards. It's a little bit like the joke about the child who tells his mother, when I want to grow up, I want to be a rock star, and she says to him, well, you can't be both. And... Uh, <laughs> So we, we have a highly individualistic culture. So for example, special case pleading over extraordinarily expensive medications. It causes me deep indigestion, and some of my colleagues get up and promote for a drug that our health service is busy trying to say, no, we won't take it until you lower the price. And the next thing is we're taking, because of special case pleading in our setup, we're taking medications that cost half a million a year, we're not increasing the budget, so when you get your stroke and you don't get therapy, it's because we've allowed this individualistic culture to arise. And we need to be aware of that. The third thing is we are recovering from undue clerical influence. I'm the generation that just about missed the belt of the crozier, but the idea that bishops would tell you not to go to a football match against Yugoslavia because it was a communist, godless country, uh, the idea, you know, strictures on everything from dance halls and jazz, uh, even the very fact, many of you may or may not know that the church in Belfield, in our major university for 
which is supposed to be a secular institution, is not built on UCD land. It's built on a disgraceful workaround by the board of UCD to allow the Knights of Columbanus to buy that plot of land for the church. So we have had undue clerical influence, and particularly, I'm fascinated, it doesn't bother me, but for example, when the Loyola Institute was presented to a number of the universities in Ireland, a rabid burst of anti-Catholicism burst out, and the reason for that is a large amount of our intelligentsia are and people, particularly people in the late 50s, early 60s, 70s, are, are recovering from this. And, you know, we've got to be open about that. There is an ethical inarticulacy. I went through Trinity. There wasn't a single minute of uh, ethics teaching. My brothers went to UCD, where, in fact, there was a very strong Catholic. There were clerics came in. And I've not, I'm a committed but critical believer. Uh, but um, clerics uh, were in lecturing them in a secular university. And I just felt, hmm. And uh, there was a very, so there is, uh, and uh, when I started setting up ethics teaching in Trinity, there was actually a backlash against the fact that it came from the school of religions. So people are sensitized here, and I'll come back and talk about how, how we deal with that. Consistency is not a strong suit. It's not strong suit of the Irish. It's not, um, uh, Emerson talks about uh, an unwritten consistency being the hobgoblin of a small mind. But this comes through time again, and I'm going to focus in on this, particularly on the suicide issue, but also on selective abortions. Ageism and disability prejudice is really, really common. So, uh, uh, you know, there's ads in the paper, uh, old me, never, and they're talking about uh, an, an anti wrinkle cream. Well, if you were to say wrinkly me, never, that's fine. But by saying older me, never, you're actually, it's like turkeys voting, not only voting for Christmas, but actually heating the oven and uh, getting into the tray. Okay. And lastly, a very troubling stance. I would have written in the Irish Times about this, about the Irish, uh, what was then the Irish Human Rights Commission around assisted suicide, where they put forward this really bizarre case that even though we all consider suicide to be a bad thing, uh, that because able-bodied people could commit suicide, but the disabled-bodied person, disabled person mightn't be able to, that it was actually a breach of rights of the disabled person not to be able to do this. So, and again, it, it really is, it, it's a classic example of almost uh, the bright kids in the debating uh, society and university scoring points of legalism. It really is uh, very troubling, uh, their position when it came to the court case. So, what do we do? Well, I think the most important thing is for those of us, there's people in the room here of all beliefs, belief systems, and none. And I think the important thing for those who do have belief systems, and the likelihood is that there will be more rather than less in the room, is that this must be debated in pluralist. Now, I didn't say secular. It must be debated in pluralist and universal terms. And I think for those with a philosophical interest here, Jürgen Habermas talks about in late in life, he came... He, originally had no place for the religions in his talking, but he saw them as sources of virtuous thinking, and he has developed this trope, uh, methodological atheism, where you look for the thought content in what the great religions are telling you, but you don't take the dogma. And I think that's going to be really important. Now, this is not, you know, uh, the second point then is very much to clarify uh, that religious values do not render you decerebrate, but also that those with no belief, with, with no formal belief systems, and I, I'm, I believe everybody is spiritual, uh, actually share the idea that these, much of what has been promoted by a small, uh, small group of people actually is not prudent. But you know, when uh, any time people, it's not that you're not saying you're a committed Episcopalian or Catholic or whatever, and uh, the, but but you should not let your argument be be, be trodden down because you come from a religious background. It's an insult to those of religion, that they have no independent thought, and it's an in, in, insult to those who don't, because they believe this isn't prudent, despite um, not having a formal belief system. And lastly, it really is important to engage with human rights discourse. And I have to say, it really is, Donnelly's book is really interesting in this regard. Uh, the, the doctrinaire, uh, human rights does tend to attract a certain type of intellectual uh, discourse and thought. And it's really important, if you're interested in this area, you've got to get in there and engage with it and its challenges. So you'll hear the most doctrinaire human rights people would say there's no hierarchy within human rights. Of course there's hierarchies within human rights. And many of them are social constructs. 
and we have a role in society in, in constructing uh, those social constructs. So I think this is really important, I suppose, and again, it's not to confuse pluralism with militant secularism. So, consistency. Um, my other hat, or other area, I'm currently on secondment around road traffic and safety, because I'm very interested in older drivers. Um, three times as many people die of suicide in Ireland as die in road traffic accidents. And yet the determined failure not to link this with the tragedy of assisted suicide is, is really very, very challenging. And there's almost an intimation that those who, you know, that, well, these are deranged people or these people who don't have insight. Um, in fact, and it's, it's one of the things I'll come back to in the armamentarium of our preparing these discussions, you've got to look at science, you've got to know about suicidology. So it really, really is important. But I think the second point is the really important one. And for those who are interested, I think, in terms of uh, articulacy, this issue of those who are left behind. Honora O'Neill talks exceptionally well around how autonomy, you know, uh, autonomy has gone wild in a sense. That, um, now, autonomy clearly is very important, but uh, how we have failed to understand what Ed Edward Pellegrino talks about is that all autonomy is exercised in the embrace of others. So that, in fact, you know, the autonomy is not a freestanding uh, quality out there in isolation, in a vacuum. Now, of course, autonomy has a leadership role in terms of what you want in terms of um, tolerable and intolerable treatment. And in general, it's something that is given, nearly always given due course. But I have to say, my, my, my moment of, 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 of that usually helped me here, and I'm a great believer in using arts, humanities, as well as science, to support, back up, and find articulacy, was a, um, a documentary on BBC of T Terry Pratchett, who thankfully, despite his discourse and rhetoric of assisted suicide, died a natural death, uh, going to Dignita the mislabeled Dignitas in Switzerland. And what's most interesting in this is, this is the discomfort of those around them. So the mother of the young man with multiple sclerosis who wanted to commit, who wanted to assist, assist suicide, the awful dilemma she was put in where she didn't want not to be with her son, but she still wanted her son around. And indeed the phrase, I, I, what's nice, I, I'm a great believer in the professional insights of editors because I don't pick the emphasis, it's the editor who picks the emphasis. And that not wanting to be a burden is the greatest burden of all. Not wanting to be a burden is our turning our back on our mutual interdependency. It's turning our back on the moral values and insights of caring. And I'm going to come back to this at the end, the issue of how we portray caring. And those of us who do advocacy for diseases of later life and disability need to be really careful how we portray uh, the caring task. But I'm a carer myself, and it's actually part of my life. I'm really glad to be looking after uh, the person I'm looking after or whose care I'm coordinating. And um, uh, thankfully, you know, every so often she says, oh, I'm a burden. And every so often we say, well, we were, we were a burden too. <laughs> this, you know, it's, uh, but anyway, so I think the, the issue of we, there needs to be a constant, those who are engaged in this area and wish to become articulate must, under, must have within them those who understand the science of suicidology so that they can rebut the fact that this is some different group of people. Every uh, premature death, uh, is something we don't want. And again, this is a classic example. Can we imagine if Joanna Trollope had spoken about perhaps race in this way or sex in this way, but, and even the portrayal, and I'll come and talk about the little bit of science about what life is like with dementia, but a greater fear is going gaga. Now, we've actually moved on in mental health so, you know, if she, if she get a severe depression, she wouldn't talk about herself, I fear being insane. You know, she wouldn't use this negative language and being a burden and helpless to others. And again, not, it's, we, we've got to perhaps develop an articulacy that says that, that, that we don't talk about people in cancer in our society being a burden on society. We ex and even though we know a significant number will die as a result of it, but we have shifted our mindset and our compass for cancer is that we don't see cancer as an, a burden. We see it's something worthwhile going out and supporting. And what we've got to do is make it worthwhile to go out and support those who care and those who have dementia. 
So my, one, of, one of my crusades at the moment is the idea is if I'm looking after my mother, uh, should what I'm doing be described in terms of care or burden, or should the burdensome elements of it be referred to as the burdensome aspects of care? And this is really important. Iconography is important. This picture comes from the Journal of the American Medical Association. It's a patient page. So every so often they have a page you can cut out and photocopy or download off the web and give to your, 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 your patients. And look how they portray caring. You know, it's, it's all negative tropes. And I think most of us want to look. I, I'm, I've worked in several different countries. Most people, no matter the strains of modern day life and families and new family situations and, and, and everybody working, people love their parents in general and want to look after them. And this, is, this picture does nobody any service. But I've been involved with the Alzheimer's Society, I've been involved with advocacy for older people, and we mustn't say, we mustn't emphasize care or burden, but rather the burdensome aspects of care. So uh, again, coming back to the um, Human Rights Commission, and again, uh, I, I, think, I think we need to develop a due articulacy and in a small country not to be uh, unduly scared of coming out and talking. And it is, you know, they're, they're, how do we get this balance right? It's going to be a, a big challenge. So one of the first things we've got to do is build up ethical articulacy. And again, it's quite a challenge in the university, so I would have to say I'm a bit disappointed in Trinity. Uh, we would have had, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you don't teach ethics like you teach health and safety regulations. You don't get in a teacher to teach them, but that's effectively what they have. They don't, as, and very often they mix ethics, and this is a real problem in the United Kingdom as well, they mix small departments of ethics and medical jurisprudence or medical law together. Now, that means you don't give due uh, uh, privilege and support to both, and when push comes to shove, people tend to revert to legalism. So it really is important that you get a department of ethics teaching that's embedded with clinicians with an interest that has a research element, that has a postgraduate element, and that has an undergraduate element. I'm, 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 other than the College of Surgeons, which has some research in its, in, its, in its ethics department, I'm not aware of any of the medical schools having a substantive research postgrad element to their undergraduate teaching. People are bought in almost to do undergraduate teaching. So we need to, it's something that needs to be developed. And uh, again, I think often some of the concepts within ethics, for example, like virtuous, virtue, virtue almost, people are almost um, um, shy of using uh, words like virtue. It sounds like a Victorian um, trope. Um, um, whereas I'm fascinated, Atul Gawande, whose most recent book, Being Mortal, is truly fascinating around the area of death and comfort and death. He talks in his book, Better, about making health systems better. He uses the phrase, do the right thing. And I know when I talk to the students, they're uncomfortable with words like virtue. They shouldn't be, but they are. Whereas you say, well, actually what we mean is, and you take a surgeon who writes well and is ethically informed, like Atul Gawande, and say, well, virtue is doing the right thing, um, then you can restart. But some of these words people find, find difficult. But we also need balance in how we talk. And a, a prudence is, uh, I'm fascinated by um, uh, the lack of the word prudence in, um, in uh, the medical ethics literature. And of course, we wouldn't have had the, the bank meltdown if we had a bit more prudence in our bank system. And the Greeks called uh, prudence uh, the auriga virtutum, or the charioteer of the virtues. And it was, so again, we get a huge amount around justice and courage, and particularly in the human rights uh, uh, area. People seem to be uh, obsessed with the idea of justice and courage, but very often at the expense of, t of temperance and prudence. And temperance and prudence are a harder sell to young people. Young people like being courageous, they like being just. Prudence and temperance, and that's something my grandparents do. You know? so, but we, we've got to reassert that you know, prudence, we would not have had the crash if we'd had prudence around financial planning, uh, if we'd had temperance. So prudence and temperance are are hard cells, they're subtle cells, and that's why I think you need not only science, but you need art, the arts very well. And I'll come to who I think is the great um, exponent of uh, prudence. And indeed, one of the, I often think in terms of, of professional ethics, because professional ethics at the top box there, by and large, what we're talking about is, is competence, and competence not only in your medical stuff, but competence in your ethics stuff, care, communication. 
Most disasters in clinical ethics happen because of poor communication, reflective practice. You're thinking about what it is you're doing. It's generally built on a societal contract. So that you're, you're allowed space. You don't have to do things by algorithms in medicine, in law, and other areas because there's a contract that you're given a broadish space to work in, but you've got to look after it. It's built on ethics. And they themselves are built on philosophy and theology. So there is kind of a construct there. And I think, uh, you know, I'm very grateful to ethical thinkers in areas like Dementia, like Stephen Post, who point out the Judeo-Christian underpinnings of much ethical thought. So I think, again, I'd come back to this issue here in a pluralist society. It's not that you hide, you know, that it's your belief system that dare not speak its name sort of thing, but actually but that you recognize the elements that are, are there. And one of the challenges is that the law is by and large unethical and steers a, an odd course uh, through here. And again, it's within living memory that most of Europe was covered by a totalitarian uh, regimes. And again, it's within living memory that, that uh, progressive countries like Germany had um, euthanasia programs. And uh, up into the 1970s that Sweden had sterilization uh, programs for the uh, dis disabled, handicapped, mentally ill so again, we really have to be very careful, and human rights discourse is very often much more colored by law. I'm so much more impressed by the British Human, human Rights Commission, which is headed by a philosopher. And that's what, who it should be headed by, Honora O'Neill, whereas ours is legalistic to, uh, to a fault. And I really think and again, the, the absence of uh, philosophical insights, thoughts, temperance, and prudence are really lacking. Good. So where that leads us to is again, and uh, I have to say, my apologies, I wasn't keeping up the news. I just quickly kept caught up in the European Court of uh, Human Rights. But it leads to sort of like the Terry Schiavo case where, um, you know, if, uh, it really is very sad where the, you know, the, the elements of care, parents who want to look after somebody. And uh, one of my big bugbears is um, the assumption that life with minimally conscious state is terrible. Whereas, in fact, we're agnostic, by and large, what life is, you know, we, we, we don't know, but we cannot assume that it's bad. But having been involved with the uh, ward case here, it's clear that one of the key issues in minimally conscious is the distress of the family. And I suppose one of the key questions afterwards is how well do we deal with the distress of the family? So, the, one of the helpful things of articula, uh, ethical articulacy is that one of the key things I teach the students is to avoid an artificial dichotomy. So, for example, there was a GP in Holland who performed an involuntary euthanasia on an old lady with Alzheimer's. You and I would call that murder. Uh, he actually got off with, uh, with a suspended sentence and wasn't disciplined by the Royal Dutch Medical Society. But when you read how the patient was, lying in coma in a bed, soaked in urine and stinking from bed ulcers and a necrotic pressure sore on her heel. So um, that the only outcome of poor care would be death is clearly very problematic. And this is exactly the scenario you get in Million Dollar Baby, the Clint Eastwood family that the critics so loved. I was looking at this poor woman in the rehab, clearly depressed, so her depression hadn't been treated. She had pressure sores, so she clearly had poor care and really a pillow over the face. I, I could see other therapeutic solutions than beside a, a pillow over the, over the face. And yet, there, there is this um, a, a thanatophilia, inappropriate thanatophilia, uh, around this type of area. Okay, better care is, is, is got to be the solution. And again, part of the hope thing is, you know, I think we mustn't let ourselves be, be sucker punched into say, well, because the care isn't good enough and you're not fighting hard enough for, for, for good care. I think everybody must fight for good care and it's part of natural justice, but it shouldn't stop us talking a bit more specifically about this area here. Right, use science. And this is really important. Harvey Chachanov in Winnipeg is utterly fascinating and fantastic in this area here. But he's actually, this is one of the most ignored papers in the medical literature, but he's actually shown in a huge range of people who died that actually most of them in natural death the vast, vast majority die with dignity. So it's really important that we, we use the science and the literature that's out there so that it, again, I, I go back to what I was saying at the beginning. Convictions aren't enough, dogma isn't enough. What we need is, 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 is in-depth thinking and, uh, and articulacy. So when people talk about death with dignity, Harvey Chachanov has told us what death with dignity is. It's the natural death 
that most people have and that they and their families think it is. One of the things that also causes me heartburn is when people talk about somebody with dementia saying uh, how undignified for him or he has lost his dignity. You, 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 as you look at the first words of the uh, German new German constitution after all they'd learned, is the dignity of, of, of man is untouchable. And actually, this, here's where the science helps us. This is Subi Banerjee's work on the quality of life in dementia. And actually, it approximates to that of the normal population, except there's a lower dip in the early stages when people realize they have it. But the danger is, as we portray something like Joanna Trollope did of going gaga and being a burden, whereas in fact, your, 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 your own satisfaction with life may be high. You're still relating to family, you're enjoying food. And it's around, in many ways, coping with the distress of those around you is the key issue. How, uh, and supporting both you and your family through this. And all four of my grandparents had dementia. It's in my family, so I know what I'm talking about. I'm not uh, Pollyanna, you know, speaking from some kind of ivory tower. All right. Um, now, this is the fascinating thing about consistency. And I, I, again, I think you know, it's up to us very much. Why is it for those who, again, obviously, those in the room here will be uh, considerate have, have been greatly challenging that you would be there would be an abortion on any of these counts, but the fact that there is outrage and horror around abortion because around gender, but that around disabilities there's a, a, an extraordinary silence. And uh, again, while we wish people not to have a disability, we don't wish them to not to be here because they haven't because they have a disability. And again, there's really interesting literature that again, I think we need to know and understand this literature about the impact of disability selective abortion and where it fits in with the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is very supportive of it. And again, the fact that there is virtually nobody now with Down syndrome in, in Denmark is, you know, is, is a challenging, challenging thought. But I also think we need to use the humanities and arts. And, Amour, to me, is a, is a terrifying film. It's a terrifying film, and there's two terrifying things about it. It's terrifying what's in it, but it's also terrifying about its uncritical, positive reception from the critics and society. Here, uh, again, I've written this up both in the Irish Times and the BMJ blog, so I won't delay over too long, but an upper-middle-class person who clearly didn't use his services appropriately. Um, in, uh, I've worked in France as a volunteer many years ago. France was ahead of the world in many of its community services, but he was doing it all on his own. But the last, so he didn't seem to have any support around speech and language therapy, around communication. But the very last bit is where she goes mal, mal, and he, before, just before he uh, suffocates her. Well, she could have been having a pain in her leg. J'ai mal. It could, be, it could have been a cramp in her leg. And yet, I suppose, the assumption in the cinema seemed to be, oh, this was some existential pain, which was clearly no longer tolerable. Uh, a very, very horrible movie. In fact, I'm embarrassed that the Austrian Geriatric Society gave Hanukkah an award for this. Um, but again, we need to be able to have an articulacy to say, and yet it is a very beautiful, and it's a very competent movie. Uh, there's a, they're very into music, and there's a fantastic trope in it where any bit of music in the film suddenly stops. There's kind of a metaphor for, but on the, uh, it's, it's portrayal of disability, it's, it's callous disregard for what you might have done for you in this is a situation is all about setting an agenda, and it's an agenda we need to be mindful of. The person who I think, again, it's a pity we don't do more Moliere in, um, in um, Ireland, because Moliere, what Moliere is all about is about you trying to shape your future and the stupidity of that. So in the malade imaginaire, he thinks by becoming a doctor and having all the armamentarium, he's going to stave off illness. In uh, Tartuffe, it's around storing up uh, religious credits. In uh, the bourgeois gentilhomme, it's about becoming more, 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 more upper middle class. And in uh, the, the, the miser, it's about storing up gold. It's about the folly of trying to overdetermine your future. And it's actually, it's, once you get through an idea like this, uh, my own favorite trope for, for, for example, trying to put people off the idea of a rigidly binding advanced directive is to point towards the people who took out a mortgage in 2005 when the Celtic Tiger was roaring. What seemed like a good idea then is not a good idea now. That's only your house and money. How, how much worse could it be who was legally binding 
and you'd, you'd fed into some very negative idea of life with disability in 30 years' time, and now your, your doctors are going to be legally obliged to uh, use this. I'm very for advanced care planning with a strong moral force, which is made as near the contingency as possible, but it would be against. Uh, so again, I think through using culture, uh, we, can, we, can, we can move on. So for example, uh, I'm very disappointed. I would be warning people away from the Think Ahead initiative funded by Atlantic Philanthropies, which is all about what you shouldn't have in later life. And there was a horrible video, I don't know if it's still on it, of a young fireman talking about, well, I've been to many crashes and I don't want to end up like a vegetable for my family to look after me. And I'm going, wait a minute, that's, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's not the outcome of many people and you can have a head injury and come back to life. You know, and there's a whole wider, broader picture. And in fact, this cartoon nicely uh, deals with it. I'll give you a minute. If you... I hope you can read it from the back. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, indeed. So, and again, <laughs> a little bit of humor is, again, humor is important. Humor in late life, um, I'm a great fan of the Swedish Nobel Prize winner who died in March called Thomas Tranströmer. And a bit like the last speaker talking about becoming familiar with death, but not obsessed by it. Thomas Tranströmer has the most marvelous, marvelous poems about death, a bit like Emily Dickinson. Uh, a wonderful haiku, uh, uh, Death Stoops Over Me, I Have a Problem With Chess, He Has The Answer. A fantastic poem, strongly recommended. But hu and again, with humor, it's really important. So, coming to the end then, the priorities. I think we, we've got to develop an ethics of care, communication, competency. We've got to use science. We've got to use the arts. We've got to recognize occult prejudices, particularly around disability and aging. Uh, positive, informed, relevant, and therapeutic advanced care planning, not advanced directives that say, use words like gaga or vegetable or, um, and joint working. I think there needs to be very much joined up working between philosophers, theologians, uh, clinicians, uh, people who actually have the condition. That's, that's really, really important. And there's some very positive work out there. If I was just to point in my own area, I've largely been embedded in dementia. There's a very interesting paper in social science and medicine which talks about unpicking the negative tropes around dementia. So, for example, around sort of Cartesian dualism where the mind and the body and when the mind's gone, well, that's that, around the idea of unity. Instead of talking about a war against dementia as an invader, it's a strange traveling companion. Don't forget, everybody in this room, 45 and over, you begin to have a bit of difficulty with names. But you actually gain in other ways. You're better at strategic thinking, wisdom, altruism, uh, sizing up a social situation. So again, we, this, this traveling companion is with us already. Your neurons peak at the age of 25. Clint Eastwood's just about to do another movie at the age of 85 about Sully Sullenberger, that older pilot who came down in the Hudson. So, to, to, instead of talking about the destiny of biology, to talk about natural aging, instead of going around fear of death, it's around a carpe diem, and it's about the recognition of death as, also as a, as, a, as a traveler. Instead of a reversed role, is that it's somehow each in turn, and then it's not an issue of quid pro quo and caring, it's around the good mother, uh, if that's not too gender specific element uh, in each of us. So, I'm a great fan of the uh, Bertrand Russell phrase is that uh, the demand for certainty is one which is natural to man, but is nevertheless an intellectual vice. And much of the, uh, as I would see as one of the underlying, apart, as well as prejudice against disability and the diseases of age and aging itself, much of it is around looking for a certainty that the plays of Moliere would tell you you shouldn't have, that the work of deep philosophers would tell you you shouldn't have. And, uh, but it's a subtle, subtle um, play. And again, it must be associated with, I think, a, a sense of justice in other areas as well. So uh, not just the, the single theme, but the broader theme. And again, I was very taken with the uh, uh, the, the last presentation around this broader sense of engaging the public. So thanks for the opportunity. Thank you.